Bailing out bad, bad tenants. It happens a lot where landlords say, oh yeah, well, I'm just gonna pull that from your security deposit. You broke my window, I'm pulling it from the security deposit. You have late fees, I'm pulling that from the security deposit. The HOA sent you a letter charging me money, huh, I'm gonna pull that from the security deposit. The worst of which, you paid a partial payment of rent, I'm gonna pull the balance from the security deposit. Now part of you may be thinking, well Ernie, I do that all the time. That's a simple way for me to resolve a problem. And while yes, it is a simple way for you to move money around, it inevitably makes you less secure. That deposit should remain untouched 100% until the tenant vacates. If you have any other policy, you are putting yourself at risk. Inevitably, a tenant who throughout the course of the tenancy develops these fees and fines and costs will very likely at the end of the tenancy leave with, guess what? fees and fines and costs. And if you find yourself with a deficient amount in your security deposit, you will eat those fees and fines and costs. That's not making money, that's losing money. Don't touch the funds in the security deposit for things while the tenant is on the premises. Well, Ernie, where am I gonna get these funds? How am I going to recover these losses? Let me tell you something. You have a great deal of leverage in two places. Your lease probably has, and if you're not sure of this, I urge each of you to look after today at your lease for this section. The application of funds clause. Some of you are nodding because you're familiar with this and I'm glad to see that. The application of funds clause says the following. It says, you may write in the memo of your check for rent only, exclusively for rent, not to be applied to late fees. Thank you very much. And they submit it to you and you cash it and they say, haha, you cashed it. And so you are subject to those terms. There's nothing more ridiculous than the notes in a memo line having any kind of control over anything when somebody cashes that check. That memo line is for notes for them, not directions to you. And the only thing that's stronger than that is your application of funds clause, which says you can say that, but it is meaningless and you agree to that term. In the lease, they say, when I give you funds, you can apply them to anything I owe, including non-rent obligations. That includes late fees, that includes HOA fines, that includes uh, unpaid rent, that includes um, damages for things that they cause through their negligence. And so as long as you have fairly given them written notice that they owe any one of these things, some of them you don't have to give notice of. You certainly never have to give notice of unpaid rent, never. It's in the lease. They know they owe it. You never have to give uh, notice of late fees. Uh, but you probably would have to give notice of repair costs. If little Timmy was playing baseball and he shattered a window, you went and uh, you repaired it, and I always encourage landlords to do their own repairs. Because if little Timmy breaks windows and big Timmy, the dad, tries and goes and fixes it and does a terrible job, guess what you have? You have another repair to pay for, All right? So don't, don't, don't let the Timmys uh, do any of the repairs. You handle 100% of your repairs. Little Timmy broke the, the, the window, you repaired it, you give them a reasonable amount of time to pay. Here's a, a bill for $100, is what it cost me to repair this window. Please pay it within seven to 14 days. Right, generally speaking, at the next time that rent is due. Now, they may not pay it, but guess what? If they gave you the full amount of the rent, they did pay it because you can apply the first $100 to cover that repair. You gave them adequate notice and you have that application of funds clause. And so you take those funds and wipe out that debt 
and the rest is rent. And so the second feature of your lease that makes this extremely powerful, that gives you extreme leverage, is the default section in your lease. It says, if you have unpaid rent, I can evict you. Now, chances are they're gonna get a little less upset about the fact that they owe you money when you have all of the leverage. You gave them a reasonable amount of time to pay, they refused to pay or were unable to pay, right? And then you sent them a reasonable notice. By the way, today is the fifth or the sixth or the seventh and you have failed to pay the full balance of rent, to which they'll respond, whoa, 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 I paid the full amount of rent. So, well, you paid the amount equal to rent, but you covered non-rent obligations first. So while the total would have been good otherwise, you cleared these out in accordance with the application of funds clause, and now you have a rent balance. If you fail to pay that, I will proceed with an eviction. All of this, always, 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 in writing, right? You send a written notice to them every time. Anytime there's a default, you send a notice to them. Now, if this happens over and over and over again, you may just go straight to the notice to vacate, right? So you can send a notice of default, a notice of non-payment, uh, as a kind of reminder. But at a certain point, um, things have probably broken and, and, and you're, you're looking to terminate. That's when a notice to vacate comes. All of these notices, every single time, in writing. And so when the tenant is in default, you shift the burden on them. You don't take any additional responsibility. You don't take in any additional risk. The burden is always on them. Do they want an eviction on the record? Do they want to be put out in a few days? Maybe, probably not though, probably not. Not over $100, right? They're likely gonna come up with it and say, okay, here you go, here's the balance. Uh, and now they know going forward, if little Timmy breaks another window and you have to come and repair it, they're going to have to pay it within 7 to 14 days or whatever reasonable amount of time you gave them for that repair. But if you are essentially bailing them out when they're the ones who did something wrong, you're never going to enforce either the correct application of funds and so many times, landlords just waive these fees. Well, it's just the cost of doing business, they say to themselves. It's the cost of doing bad business, is what that is. Because that's not your fee. Those aren't your costs. These are not your fines. They belong to the tenant, and only the tenant should be paying them. And the consequence should fall not on the shoulders of the landlord, the investor, or the property manager, but on the tenant. That's what the lease is in place to do. That's how you as landlords make money. Landlords, as always, we welcome you to follow us on our Instagram page. If you're not a member yet, join us on Facebook. Uh, and if you enjoy what you see here, give us a thumbs up. Click that like button. We enjoy that very much. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. Now I want to talk about how you take care of the security deposit at the end of the lease. You guys know if someone skips out and continues owing you rent, the big one, obviously, they owe you rent, you can pull that directly from the security deposit. No problem. The problem that landlords and property owners and uh, property managers come into is when they charge for repairs. Now, in your mind, you're thinking, well, if I have to pay for a repair, of course the tenant is going to pay for it out of the security deposit but that's not as clear cut as it might first sound. Let me give you two scenarios. The first scenario is a tenant comes in and right before they came in, I just installed brand new carpet. And so the tenant is the first one to get to use that carpet. They're there for 12 months and I go after they're gone and wouldn't you know, Kool-Aid stains all over the living room carpet. And so I have to rip that out, install new carpet. Is the tenant liable there? I think it's pretty clear that they are. Let's go and do a different scenario. I installed that new carpet five years ago. Tenant comes in. Tenant is there for 36 months. And at the end of 36 months, I go in and I see Kool-Aid stains all over the living room carpet. I rip it out and I replace it.
Can that tenant be charged? Probably not. Because after eight years, your carpet probably has a zero dollar value. And because it lacks value, you can't sue to recover for your actual damages because you've experienced no damage. You probably had to, even if you could keep the rest of the carpet because it was in pretty good shape. That carpet, for all intents and purposes, in the eyes of the law, has zero value and therefore you cannot sue to recover for it. Now you tell me, Ernie, but that damage goes over and above ordinary wear and tear. And while you are 100% right, the problem isn't the, 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 the fact that the tenant was negligent, that the tenant damaged the property over and above normal wear and tear. The problem was there was no value in the thing they damaged. It would be like they set fire to garbage. Mm -hmm. Garbage has zero value. It doesn't matter that somebody could have used the garbage, that there might have been value. Once it's in a trash can, it has zero value. And if, it's, if somebody sets fire to it, they haven't destroyed anybody's property. There's zero there, and so anything destroyed there is no consequence. Absolutely zero, right? And so yes, we're, we, we don't want to think of the, the stuff in our home as, as garbage, but we do have to think about it in terms of whether it has actual value. And after eight years, most judges are gonna say zero value in that car. One to three years, different story, right? And then you gotta go into things like quality and you know, uh, the, the, the craftsmanship, you know, um, as you get three to five years, you know, some carpet lasts longer than others, some carpet is a higher quality than others, and so th these are other factors. But when it's very cut and dry, 12 months, and there's, there's, there's damage, you can probably recover for that. Eight years, probably not. So that's a rule of thumb. So let's talk about ordinary use and ordinary wear and tear. You take the house back and there are holes all over the walls. Whoa. There's four holes here and four holes there and four holes there. But they are small and they are for pictures. Is that ordinary use? Is that ordinary wear and tear? No. I, I, I would say no. that if they're small, it probably is. No. Now, you can gamble and say, I paid $10,000 to fix these walls. <clears throat> like, okay. I, I don't know that that's necessarily, uh, that, that that makes sense. But you run the risk of a court saying, who doesn't hang pictures? How did you not know that pictures were going to be hung and that the walls would be used in this way? This is probably a cost of doing business sort of loss. Ordinary use, ordinary wear and tear. Now, what if those holes were bullet holes? <laughs> not <Bullet> ordinary <laughs> use. Now, or, or, or the holes. You know, punch <laughs> holes, or the doorknob through the wall. That, there's nothing ordinary about that. There's nothing normal. That's not the way these things are supposed to be used. That you can definitely charge. I had a dog uh, once who was teething, and she put her, her muzzle against the wall and, and carved out a big hole. <laughs> that's not normal. That's not the way that wall was intended to be used. She did. I charged her for it, uh, but ultimately I had to cover that cost. We, we want to be thoughtful about the way that we charge our clients. If we can say 100% definitively, they did this and they misused the property, charge them. If it's, um, mm, I always tell landlords, a 50-50 argument isn't worth the argument, because you have just as much chance to lose that argument. And guess what? Then you get hit with a wrongful withholding claim. <coughs> Let's talk about a wrongful withholding claim in the state of Texas. If you have a $3,000 deposit and you send back 1000 and you keep 2000 and you cannot justify that it was applied to actual damage or to damage that exceeded normal use or ordinary wear and tear they can sue you for up to three times any amount wrongfully withheld. So now you thought it made sense to keep the 2,000 because you had to paint and you had to clean and you had to da 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 da. But now they're suing you because you can't justify these things in accordance with chapter 92 of the Texas Property Code. And if you simply can't do it and you don't know for a fact that it passes these two tests, there's value in the thing I had to repair and 
the damage exceeded ordinary use and ordinary wear and tear, just don't do it. It's too high of a risk. Because if you are sued, now they can recover $6,000 for the 2,000 wrongfully withheld, $100, I don't know where they came up with that number, but $100, and then all of their attorney fees. You could be looking at a $10,000 claim in a small claims court when you thought you were totally justified. Don't take that risk. If it's a 50, if it's a jump ball kind of thing, uh, you may want to discuss it with them and you may want to say, tenant, I believe I'm entitled to 2,000. What say you and I go 50-50? I will agree to send this if we can agree that that's a fair distribution of security deposit. If they say, okay, that sounds fair, then do it, right? You get them to agree to it in writing, uh, and you don't have to do anything formal. An email will suffice, right? But if they'll agree to that, then you know if they do later sue you, you say, I resolve this matter, we talked it out, and they agreed to this amount, right? But if you just keep it and hope they're gonna take it, when it's a 50-50, not worth the risk. But these are things that we can also protect ourselves from. If you are unsure, talk to somebody. Talk to somebody who's done it a, a, you know, 10 times more than you have. If you've got three doors, talk to somebody with 30 doors, right? Uh, if, if you've talked to an attorney once, maybe go do it again, right? Just to ask, because you're so much better off just asking the question, can I do this? I don't know how many times I've sat with landlords and I do a red light, green light, yellow light um, uh, talk through their uh, inventory list. So you have to send that itemized list of all the damages where security deposit funds were applied. And you've got to do it within 30 days after they leave and after they've given you a forwarding address. So your tenant leaves and you're preparing that list. And sometimes landlords will come to me and say, um, I sent this list, I sent it on time, and I believe I'm 100% justified, but I'm being sued. Will you look at my list for me? And so we go through it and I go, Green light is you absolutely could charge it. It, it. it meets the two standards that I talked about. There is actual harm, and it's over and above normal use and ordinary wear and tear. Yellow is at 50-50, and red is you were never justified in charging these fees. And we go through, we mark each one on the list, and if there's enough green to cover the, so the security deposit, great, there is no claim. If it's a little green and a bunch of yellow or a bunch of red, you might have a problem. And now we have to start talking <coughs> settlement with the other party. And so I would suggest having this conversation, if you are unsure, before you mail out the itemized list, then sending it out and then making that appointment after you've been sued. Because at that point, it may be too late to settle for less than what you otherwise would have refunded. Now you're talking about some multiple of what you actually wrongfully withheld. So don't put yourself in that position.